Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding is made possible by grants from AM Trust Title, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Colliers International, NYC, Cohen Equities, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. I grew up in Long Island. I want to be a physician? Nah. Uh, maybe I'll be the, the kid, you know, from the, the beach club and make some money, you know, moving the chairs and other things. Vanderbilt? University of Pennsylvania? Cardoza Law School? Oh, wow. Law firm in New Jersey? Wolf and Sampson? What is this over there? Bellmead? Westminster? Nah, you know, I really have a calling. I got a calling that I, I know this guy named Levinson. Maybe we'll do L&L. What's L&L? L&L is the repositioning properties, taking over properties. A major landlord and owner in New York. I have Rob Lapidus over here. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for having me. So tell me about the grandparents and how they arrived in the, in the promised land. So my mother's side of the family... Um, my grandmother was born in Buenos Aires, um, 1899, came over here when she was about two or three years old. And my grandfather was actually born in Boston. So he was actually first generation here. My grandfather was a genius back in the day when, you know, I don't know how they measured it, but he went to Harvard on a full scholarship when he was around 14 years old. And he finished one year completely. And then he had three sisters and his parents decided that he had to work to help support the family so the sisters could marry off well. Um, long story short is he never finished college, although Harvard did invite him back for the 50th reunion, which he was very proud about. And he, you know, he worked in industry and like he worked at Stop and Shop, he worked at Litton Industries. He never became what he could have. And his sisters, who were all supposed to marry off well, um, you know, one of them was married three or four times. Um, one was not in a great marriage, and one was married, you know, married well. So the, the, the math didn't work out that well for okay, great-grandma. So let's go to the other side of the family. Okay. My, my father's mother, my grandmother, was born in Latvia, and my father's father was born in Russia, more, a more typical ascendancy, and they settled in Brooklyn. And tell me about them. So my grandfather was in the clothing business, and my grandmother was a very avant-garde woman. She was way ahead of her time. She was a great businesswoman. She actually taught me how to play poker, and she taught me how to invest my bar mitzvah money. And she was in the optical supply business, and back in the day 
when my grandfather was making $60 a week, she was making $600 a week. And she invested her money, you know, post-depression in stocks, did very well. And then in the optical supply business, her business was failing. And her advisors all told her that she should file for bankruptcy. Back then, you didn't do that. Her word is her bond, her name. So she put all her money back into the business and it ended up failing again. So she was fairly wealthy at a certain point in her life and then, you know, pretty much lost it. So tell me about your dad. My dad... He was born here. He was born in Brooklyn. Um, the, the definition of mensch was my father. Um, the nicest, kindest, gentlest human being you ever met. No one disliked Victor Lapidus. Um, really great guy and really a model for how I act today and a model for, you know, a lot of, a lot of good things in my life. So he, he was, you know, World War II veteran. Um, you said it, to me, wasn't he involved with the Arizona Project, uh, um, Alabama? The, uh, the, bomb. the atomic bomb, the right, atomic right. Bomb. So what happened was my dad was in his platoon and he, he, he got sick and his, 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 his group got shipped out and most of them got killed. He became part of this sort of ragtag group of misfits who they just threw together. And supposedly my dad said, you're never supposed to volunteer in the army. But they asked, can anyone type well? My father volunteered. He was stationed in Alabama and he was typing things and what he was typing, like coded messages, took priority over things coming from Washington, D.C. They like, didn't really understand why because they didn't tell him. It was sort of a need-to-know basis. And he found out subsequently that he was involved in sending messaging you know, for the, for the atomic bomb project. So, so thank goodness he didn't, wasn't deployed because I wouldn't be here. He'd be talking to no one today. He'd have no guests. Uh, and so anyway, my dad went to uh, Brooklyn College, Columbia Optometry School, became an optometrist, and you know, practiced you know, most of his life, worked six days we'll, a week. We'll get to that. Dad and the, tell me about mom. My mother... She was the Bostonian. Correct. So my grandfather, who was the genius from Harvard, his two daughters, my mother and my aunt, were also very, very good students. Both, both graduated top of their class and both went to college to UMass. Um, my mom was in New York working at a bank and she met my dad. And so that's... My dad used to joke that he wanted to marry a woman from England, but the best he could do was New England. That was one of Vic's sense so, of humor. So, so now Vic went into the business because grandma had the optical business? The, it was funny. My grandmother, the, the smart businesswoman, told my dad to go into the pantyhose business. Said that women wear them all the time, they rip all the time, they replace over and over. He didn't. He wanted to be a professional. And I guess because of the sense, you know, understanding about the optical business to a degree, that's the direction he went as opposed to, you know, medicine, podiatry, dentistry, whatever. So when did your parents move out to uh, Long Island? They got married in 57 and moved shortly thereafter. I was born in 61, so they had the house. I was okay, so tell time. me, growing up in, in Long Island, what, what was it like in 61, 65, I mean, when you were a kid? I mean, probably the 70s is more in when the you memory. Remember? Okay. Right, when I remember. I mean, you have a few memories of the 60s. Um, it was an idyllic setting. You know, it was exactly the post-World War II generation. Leave it to Beaver? Yeah, I would, would, not, ex not exactly, you know, Ward and Wally, but um, it, was a, it was a simple existence. You um, said your dad worked six days a week. He did. We had dinner late all the time because, you know, my, we'd wait for my father to come home, and my friends would very often be over, and we'd have, like, a second dinner, you know, with them. Now, did you uh, work in the optical business with that? I did not. Um, the only thing I did when I went to college, my freshman year, I actually sold glasses. I, I went around door to door to make some extra money um, through, you know, through a relationship, one of my father's like suppliers. Um, that was the only, I, I never wanted to do it. Well, it didn't really interest me, but that was the only connectivity other than getting, you know, free sunglasses, contacts. So where did you go to public school? In Belmore, I went. To, I graduated from Kennedy High School. You know, one of the many Kennedy High Schools after JFK assassination. And in the summers, you said you went to summer camp. I went to camp in Beckett, Massachusetts, a camp called Watito. Uh, my sister went there too, and I still have a couple of good friends from camp. People say uh, Rob Lapidus is, you know, a, a seasoned, established real estate guy. Is that what they say? 
Very few people <laughs> realize that Rob Lapidus wanted to be a physician. What what happened? I I, I know it's in the genes or it's in mm -hmm. the heritage that you should become a doctor or a lawyer or probably or right. an accountant. So so what happened? Well, th think about that, right? My wife's an accountant. You know, her brother's a lawyer. The other one's a dentist. Um, so probably the mindset back then was security, right? I, I grew up middle class. I wasn't deprived, but I certainly had aspirations to have more, have a little more control over my life financially. And so the, the thesis was, okay, back then you're becoming a doctor, it's like a good, a good track. I actually applied to a six year medical program. Um, uh, Sophie Davis. Program. Sophie Davis Center of Biomedical Education, CUNY. Um, and I got into it after I was already in college, and I could have like finished the semester and go there. But how did you decide Vanderbilt? I mean, so it was interesting. My dad, who lived in Alabama for a while when he was, you know, younger, um, we had discussed that, you know, maybe going outside of the New York metropolitan area with the same demographic, going somewhere else would be a, an expanding type of experience. Number one. Number two is considering going into medicine. Vanderbilt had one of the finest medical schools back there. So my mom and I and my best friend and his mom, we traveled the South and we looked at, you know, we, we went to, we did, you know, Emory and Duke and Vanderbilt and Rice and Tulane and all, basically the whole Southern contingency. And I got into all of those schools, just had the best time at Vanderbilt and just thought it was, it felt so right. You go to Vanderbilt and uh, what happens? Is it uh, meeting the girlfriend that uh, changed your mind that you wanted to leave Vanderbilt, you wanted to leave medicine? It was probably a combination of things. I, I never felt that going into medicine was the passion I had. It just felt like a safe zone. So I, th I think studying for a while, I was majoring in molecular biology back then. Um, it was fine, but not great. The summer after my freshman year, I met my wife. And a combination of things. I, I decided I didn't want to go that track anymore. I also, we got engaged not too long after we met, believe it or not, and we wanted to be closer together. Penn was a school I had gotten into originally, but so I applied so to transfer there. You, you met her where, at the Beach, beach, beach Club? Beach Club, July 13th, 1980. July 13th, 1980, so this 19-year-old kid meets his pre future wife, and what were you doing? Uh, setting up chairs or, I was, I, or taking care of the card games? No, I, well, I was a cabana boy, I did everything. So a couple of things. But I was, the, the money really was made not in the cabanas. The money was made on the tips. Okay, the, it was all oh, about all, all about tips. tips. All about tips. So I was making six hundred dollars a week in cash in nineteen eighty. I was loaded. I lived at home. I, I had no expenses. So I met my wife, my future wife. I came home, told my dad I met the girl I'm going to marry today. So um, obviously there was a connection there, and you know my wife jokes that we're on a month to month now. Um, but we married 34 years. Obviously, it was a great moment in my life. And so but you hustled to, to make the money for the engagement ring, you told me. Well, I hustled to make money, period. And I made a lot of money. And what ended up happening is decided to get engaged. And all of that money went towards buying the engagement. I also was a coin collector. I had to sell a couple of my coins to top it out um, to pay for the ring. You were one year in. You, can, you continue for another year uh, at Vanderbilt. Correct. And then you decide to go to Penn. Correct. When did you decide to leave the, the medical world and decide that you wanted to be a lawyer? Sometime during that period of time when I was no transferring. No, it, was, it wasn't an epiphany to be a lawyer, for sure. It was an epiphany not to be a doctor. And then, you know... It was sort of like, what am I going to do? I minored in business. I took some core curricula at Wharton. Didn't really make sense to me to go get an MBA. So I figured, you know, nice Jewish boy, I'll go, I'll go get a law degree. And back then, if you asked me what I would do with my law degree, I would tell you that I was probably going to be an agent manager for musicians or athletes. I'm so both. when did you get involved with the love of the Grateful Dead? Um, in, the ninth, in high school. In high school, um, a friend of mine in high school turned me on to the dead. I started seeing them in the late 70s, I'm 500 shows or so in. And what's amazing now, Tom, Circle of Life, I, I know the guys in the band. I've done charity work with them. Um, as a matter of fact, I saw, I saw an off-Broadway dead show last night that the keyboard player for the dead is a friend of mine, Jeff. 
produced. So it's just, it's, music has always been a big part of my life. I, my first musical love was the Beatles, then Billy Joel, nice Long Island boy, and then, you know, the Dead. And so I still love all different types of music, but clearly the Grateful Dead is my number one choice. What you do with the summers at Penn? One year, I worked at a law firm. I know I worked at a law firm, I think, after my junior year, um, downtown, just getting a feel for, okay, is this something I think I might want to do? Um, and then the next year, we got married. So that summer, you know, we got married, went on our honeymoon, came back. My father-in-law owned coffee shops. So myself and my brother-in-law, who also got married that same summer, we worked at Bellevue. We were patients at Bellevue. We worked at Bellevue. He was like a short order cook, and I was a cashier. So they had coffee, shop, they coffee shops and hospitals, mostly. So they ran the coffee shops in Bellevue and some of the And a Misericordia, Montefiore, places like that. And the good news was we lived on 24th Street, so it was the one place we could afford to eat. So we, we would go. We had, so tip, had, we had to tip well. We had, had to tip well. That yeah, was the rule. You had the benefits of living close by. Yep. Okay. F free food, but uh, you took care of the tips. How did you decide to go to Cardoza? Um, I got waitlisted at Columbia, NYU, and Penn. I didn't get into them. Those are my first top three choices. And in New York, um, I got a partial scholarship there and just felt like the right place. Felt like it was a good so place to get an education. So you're in law school, and what are you thinking of? Corporate, real estate, general practice, litigation? What happens? Um, I knew that I did not want to be an attorney forever, but I felt that getting a legal degree, you really had to work as a lawyer to get value out of it. So I wanted to go to a mid-sized firm, which there weren't too many Wait in New second. York. You were in New Yorker. How did you end up in New Jersey? I mean, that was crossing the line. It's crazy. They say people from Long Island never go to New Jersey, but my wife and I, both from the island, went. Um, it was a good choice for us, but, you know, definitely not in the ordinary stream of what people do. Did you know about this firm, Wolf and Sampson? No, knew nothing, knew nothing about them. So I wanted to be in a mid-sized firm because I wanted to get experience. In New York, I had offers at two really large firms and a couple really small firms because my major was international relations and a minor in international business and languages. I was recruited by some firms that had a very small niche practice, which I didn't want to do, and I didn't want to be in a library for five years. So I wanted a mid-sized firm. There really weren't too many in New York, and I didn't get job offers from any of them. But in New Jersey, um, some of the top firms were mid-sized firms. So I interviewed with a few of them, got a job offer. At Wolf. It was Kimmelman, Wolf & Sampson, or Wolf & Sampson. Went back and forth when Erwin Kimmelman was the Attorney General of the state of New Jersey. When he was that, it was Wolf & Sampson when he came back. His name was on the front of the so door. So you stayed at Wolf, Wolf & Sampson for a couple of years. Correct. Get involved with dealing with certain of the real estate players, prominent New Jersey real estate players who also did business in New York. And then what happens? An opportunity with a company called Bell Mead? Correct. So what was interesting was when I was an attorney, I did corporate work and real estate work. And one of my clients, I'll never forget, would come Friday on his way to the shore, give me a pile of stuff, and said, you know, please do this. I'll get back to you Monday. And he went down to the shore for the weekend. And I'm like, hmm, uh, something about doing that seems a little bit better than working all weekend on this stuff. So maybe that was a seed planted. So I worked there for a couple of years, got some good experience. And, but I decided that, you know, I didn't want to pursue the career of being like a partner in a law firm. I went to a closing with one of the guys, one of the partners in my firm. And he was, he was all excited about the closing and doing the deal. And I wasn't. So I just knew that wasn't the path for me. So I started interviewing. And... I went from five Becker Farm Road to four Becker Farm Road in Roseland, New Jersey, and went to work for my landlord. My landlord was Bellmead Development Corporation, the vision of the which Chubb was a wholly owned subsidiary of Chubb. Chubb acquired them in 1970. And I really learned the real estate business inside Bellmead. I started off as an in-house counsel, and several years into it, the president of my company came to me and said, you could be the next general counsel here, and I think it would be a terrible waste of your abilities. He said, you have a great business sense. What happened was people would give me deals to work on, and I would do everything. I would do the legal, the business, and I learned about construction and management and financial structuring. So it was a great apprenticeship, for lack of a better word. And so I took, the, I took that opportunity 
and I started working on, on the business side. So I was involved with overseeing our 12 million square foot office portfolio, and then later on, I oversaw big residential projects. So it was a really, really great opportunity for me. And I was happy, it wasn't like I was unhappy. Chubb was getting pressure from its investors to divest from its ancillary businesses. So they sold their life insurance company, Chubb Life, and then after that, they ended up selling Bell Mead. I was involved you know, in the sale, it was funny, Goldman Sachs was representing us, Whitehall was bidding on us, no, no conflict there. And then when Payne Weber bought Bell Mead, you know, they ended up calling Morgan Stanley, a joint venture with them, who had a relationship with a company called Gale & Wentworth. And I had an opportunity to go forward with that company, but I decided I wanted to, ch I wanted to change at that point. So I had a good relationship with the president of my company, I had like a golden parachute, he said, go find something, and when you do it, I'll fire you, and you'll get everything you need, and that's what happened. So I got my stock, got my money, got my car, and at the time during residential development, I was doing some joint ventures with the Kushners. So I was dealing with Murray and Charlie, and so I ended up working at one of, uh, you know, we formed a company called Westminster Capital, Charlie and myself basically did sort of financing acquisitions um, and developments in sort of in New York's tri-state area. I was only there for a short time, um, and then from there, I moved back into the city. I started working with a guy named Bruce Brickman. And while I was there for a couple of years, that's when I met David. So David, so Lewis, how did you meet David? He brought a deal also to a us. Guy who was an interesting background. Very interesting background. Correct. Another Long Island boy. Um, so, but family from the toy business. Yes, exactly correct. So. David brought a deal to us. At and, Bruce Berkman's shop. At Berkman's shop. And that's, that's where I met him. And when I met David, I saw, I saw something in him that was very different from what you would think of as a typical broker. He was a very strategic thinker, um, really good common sense, very smart. And I just sort of knew that this was, was a talented guy. So after a few years at Berkman, it was, an, it was okay, but it was really time to sort of move on. I decided what was going to be next. And David and I spent some time together. We didn't know each other that now well. Mitch, what, what was Mitch Rudin's role? Mitch Rudin introduced me to Bruce. So Mitch's uncle, Sam Ketive, was my closest friend at Bell Mead. May he rest in peace. Sam was one of the greatest guys in the world, a real mentor to me. Um, we kept each other sane around all the insanity. And... His nephew, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch Rudin and Robert Rudin were his nephews. And, and when I was going around to figure out what I wanted to do next, Mitch was the one who suggested, you know, Bruce said, you had to come back into New York. But the irony is that Mitch was also involved with CBRE, where uh, at that time in Insignia. Correct. Uh, yes. Where David was. Correct. Okay. So you and David get involved when? What was the first year? June of 2000. Okay. It's June of 2000. And I think it was the Carlisle Group or something? Correct. Okay. Gabe Fink was the principal of Carlisle, who's my relationship, and he's the gentleman we did our first few deals with. Okay, and that was a deal on West 39th Street, if I remember. So what happened was, it was really interesting. I had said to David, it's probably going to take us 6 to 12 months to get our first deal when we come together. Um, my background and David's background are very different. I had relationships, sort of institutional relationships, now, the, the capital for side. Now, the L&L, is it Lapidus first or is it Levinson? It, or, well, we don't want to say. No, no, no. It, it, the answer is it depends, like most things, right? Today here, I, I'll be first. You know, it really, it really just depends. It's, it's, it's an ongoing joke we have. But D D David and I, we thought it would take some time to get the business started. We had different skill sets, very complementary, but very similar core values. So I got a call from Gabe Fink saying they're looking at buying a deal in the city and need an operating partner. It was the quickest yes I ever gave because it was going to put us in business with a real credible firm. And so then we started and, and you know, we were working on that. And a couple of weeks thereafter, a friend of mine, Andy Geringer, called me about a deal that was a, a broken deal at 155th Avenue. And so we had our second deal. And, and so you know, right away, be, so between June when we started the business and December, we actually acquired three deals. 250 West 39th Street, which we renamed the 39th Street Fashion Center, 155th Avenue, and Metropolitan Tower. So 150 Metropolitan Tower we still own. 
and 150 is going through a, another big renovation. We're adding some space to it, and the anchor tenant lease is ending now, and we have a lease out with another tenant for the whole building. So how did you get involved with uh, the toy building? So it was being, um, Tony Malkin had owned it, sold it to Joe Chatrit, and Joe was emptying it out to do a residential conversion. Um, for whatever reason, after the building was almost empty, decided to sell it. Um, so I was dealing with you know Doug Harmon and Joe Street when Doug was at Eastell um, to buy to buy this building. This is before the uh, Midtown South was chic. It was very much a pioneering move, right? We owned 150. We understood the market a little bit, and again, David had a really great vision about what to how to transform a building and what type of tenants would come there. So our view was this was a great opportunity for an office conversion. And so negotiating with Joshua Treat was obviously an entertaining experience. We got it done. Lehman Brothers was our partner um, in buying it. And we basically, we transformed that building. We transformed that side of the park. We changed the floor plate in the building. And we were able to bring tenants from Midtown to Midtown South who wanted to change their culture. How did you get Whether, Italy to come in? Um, Italy had not existed in America yet. Right, they they were, were in Turin, Italy, and Nagano, Japan. We had an idea that we wanted to curate that space. B before that, it was Cipriani. So it was basically an event space that wasn't activated during the day, only in the evening. We wanted something that was, being that, that was going to be an amenity for the building, an amenity for the, for the neighborhood. So we had a vision for some sort of restaurant experience, maybe a few different types of restaurants. That was the idea. When Italy came to us, they had already curated the idea we were thinking about. And they were going to sign a lease and basically, you know, have all these independent groups within that under that one umbrella. So we thought it was great. They did much better than they had anticipated. I think they had to hire an additional 125 people in their first few months of, of operation. And it's, it's, it's great. Obviously, it's been a very big success for us and them and the building and the community. They've expanded beyond this. And it, it, it really, if you think about where, you know, retail's going today, everything's about experiences. So Italy is an experience, right? You can come in there, they do tours, Cooking programs. Cooking classes, right. you know, they have pizza, they have a rooftop bar. So it's a, it's a real great place to be. With like a minute left, tell me about family. So you met uh, your wife at, uh, at the beach club. You've been married, yep. what, 34, 34 years? 34 years. Tell me about the children. So I have two children. My daughter, Alexandra, Alex, is 26. She works in debt equity and structure finance at Cushman and Wakefield. Um, she's engaged to be married to a really nice guy named Evan. We're getting married next year. My son, Brian, is 23, graduated from the University of Michigan a little over a year ago. He works in uh, project management in our construction subsidiary. Um, he has a serious girlfriend, Rachel, and they're great, great kids. And how did you and David get involved with the Yankees quickly? David's been a longtime Yankee fan. David would walk around the social circuit saying if there's ever an opportunity to invest in the Yankees, we're interested. And one day we got a call from one of our lawyers and the opportunity presented itself, and here we are. You didn't go into medicine, and you went into real estate because you and David have built up a, a great business. You have two major repositionings taking place right now at 390 Madison Avenue and 425 Park. Now 1568 Broadway in Times Square. Right, in Times Square, and I'm happy that you were here. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael.